to the way we look at science also has this like superstar image attached to it. It's like something special. But in fact, there is a very large workforce of scientists and of women scientists that are very active in the country right now. And that is kind of fueling our innovation, our uh, progress for many, many years. And that is something that we, you know, kind of don't think about often because when we think about science, it's immediately these superstars who did one discovery. And if you think about it, science no longer really works like that. What is it like to be a woman scientist in India? Why don't we see enough of them? If you're quick to point Israel's women scientists or Kiran Mazumda Shaw, sadly, they're not always the norm. In fact, research has shown that women in academia are expected to be much more competent than their male counterparts to be considered for the same role. It's this bias that got Ashima Dogra and Nandita Jairaj to start the Life of Science web portal to document stories of regular women in science and the systemic bias they fight in their everyday lives. Having begun their journey in 2016, it has now given rise to their book, Lab Hopping, a journey to find India's women in science. Backed by research, it makes a reader come to terms with unsettling facts plaguing Indian academia when it comes to gender and caste diversity. In our conversation, we bring some of these issues to light and what can be done to remedy it. Hi, Ashima, and hi, Nandita. Welcome to Maharani Talks. Hi, Nati. Hi, thanks for having us. So I really enjoyed reading your book, Lab Hopping. And uh, one of my favorite quotes from your book is by American feminist, Bella Abzug in the chapter Hiring Bias, where she says, we don't want so much to see a female Einstein become an assistant professor. We want a woman Schlemiel to get promoted as quickly as a male Schlemiel. And for those listening, I'm guessing Schlemiel means a uh, person who is average or, you know, who's prone to failing. And thereby that quote sets the tone of our discussion. Uh, do women scientists in India are given as much equal opportunity as male scientists? Because in fact, if you talk to anyone about Indian science and women in Indian science, they would talk about immediately they would point out to the Isra women or Kiran Masumda Shah. But that's exactly what your book also states. This is a superstar phenomena. And you try your best not to restrict your learning or finding only to the elite cases and that you want to talk to everyday regular women. Let the book not become a sanitized version of Indian science. Putting that in viewpoint, could you talk a little bit about how the book is poised and you know, how you gave it the foundation it needs? Exactly, Marty. This is a was basically the premise of our entire project when we began that we wanted to very consciously stay away from the superstar phenomena. Also because I want to say that it's also a view of science. There is also this like, of course, there's a lot of pseudoscience, etc. in a country, but also the way we look at science also has this like superstar image attached to it. It's like something special. But in fact, there is a very large workforce of scientists and of women scientists that are very active in the country right now. And that is kind of fueling our innovation, our uh, progress for many, many years. And that is something that we, you know, kind of don't think about often because when we think about science, it's immediately these superstars who did one discovery. And if you think about it, science no longer really works like that. Uh, science is a mass, long-term process that humans do. So yeah, we wanted to stay yeah. away from that. And we, from the outset, we decided, to go to the universities, go to the smaller institute, interview uh, women scientists from all rungs of the academic ladder, from the top to the bottom, also PhD students. We also spoke to some master's students. So we really tried to keep it at the Schlemel level. Yeah, I think I just wanted to emphasize that was, you know, something that was really important to us because we felt the way women in science are being projected to us and the kind of stories that we hear are very celebratory, you know, very uh, encouraging us to think of them as these super women and not very relatable figures all the time. And 
if at all they are relatable sometimes we see the other end of the spectrum where you know where their womanness or their femininity or the the domestic side of their life is really played up as if that is the only way to be relatable to a regular a uh, woman or girl who loves science in india is like is that i do how do we show them as having lives which are very stereotypical or the other end where they just are super performers and and setting benchmark that most of us cannot aspire to and in those cases there's very little acknowledgement of the privileges that sometimes women themselves have and of course you know men men tend to have many more privileges just because of their advantages that their gender gives them but even a lot of the women uh, heroes in science uh, whether it's Kiran Mazumdar Shah whether it's Soumya Swaminathan whether it's any of the big women who are amazingly talented and brilliant no doubt but also we need to engage with the fact that are we only allowing those who have a lot of privilege to prosper in science are we not allowing the regular people the people who study in uh, smaller colleges or state universities and who don't have who don't necessarily go abroad to get the best training from nobel laureates or with a very high academic pedigree as they call it uh, are they also being given a chance if they if they good at their job you know we're not there's a misconception that what we're asking for is for uh, mediocrity and that is not right what we're asking for is that if there is people of different genders with the same amount of scientific capabilities are they all being allowed to prosper as far and what we see is not the case we see uh, this is the fact that we see a lot more mediocrity among men in science whereas women have to be these unrealistically high levels of brilliance so i think those are just some of the things that disturbed us that made us determined to get the real story of the gender gap the real story from real women of science in india yeah in fact one of the statistics that's mentioned in your book show that women actually put in more hours at work than men i'm actually really glad that the book covers such regular women scientists uh in fact when you first started shaping up the book and decided who to speak to were you a little wary about the criteria that you had to set about what kind of women scientists yet you had to talk to were you scared that people would say oh she was uh, highlighted just because she was a woman would there be more focus on the gender rather than on her work to be honest i don't think we had these fears i think we went about it very maybe even in a sense very naively because in our mind there was no doubt that the work that anybody is doing in any lab in science any scientific lab in the country is important you know whether whether it is giving them star publication you know giving them fame and recognition or not just the fact that they're sitting there doing their job generating something is worth telling a story about so if we went in just as you know as journalists but also with zero pressure to have like a you know a, a viral story or any no, no such pressures because we were working independently so we it was just honest reporting but because we were science communicators also our motive was to tell these science stories in an engaging way that people would sit up and listen even people who are not uh, associated with science in any way would be interested in the stories and the journeys and the contributions of these women and many think when it comes to gender gap in science you can reduce the gap by getting more girls interested in science which might be the case in the west where they you know give incentives or do programs to get more girl children interested in science but that's not the case in india a lot of girls are interested in science and there's a very good percentage of them up to uh, the phd level uh, in fact a quote from your book itself for the sake of our listeners uh, according to a ugc annual report from 2015 44% of science PhDs in India were women but a UNESCO data from the same year says that number of women scientists in the workforce is only 14% so why does the blame keep falling on women <laughs> that is the question that's a very important question it's a very critical question and i think this is the mistake that a lot of the policies that are trying to remedy the gender gap are also kind of fixated on and like we write in our book this is quite actually it's counterproductive 
I think we are also prone in India to kind of copy the programs and initiatives that take place in the West. So maybe that's why we're kind of falling for this. But like you read out and also in our own experience in the last few decades, we have heard so many times that the toppers of, you know, science stream, college level, uh, 10th, 12th standard, all of this are girls uh, who are studying science are at the top almost always. There's also instances of like some university in Bangalore who kind of adjusted the entrance cutoff so that boys could come in because the top ranks were taken up by women. So, you know, then suddenly there's a gender problem uh, when the toppers are all women. So I think the problem is elsewhere. Central problem is of an opportunity bias. It's how science and academia works. And it is how positions, grants, funding, opportunities, training are kind of distributed or made available. And in our findings, that is the biggest challenge there. Of course, there are other challenges like, uh, you know, ones uh, like marriage and childcare, which the Institute could also really, you know, uh, stand up. Like we could, there's so many miles to go there also to uh, really prepare that infrastructure so there is smooth access for women in whatever traditional, non-traditional background, even men in childcare responsibilities or any gender for that matter. So I think this inspiring girls into science is kind of an old idea that seems to not go away. And we need a lot more. Of course, I don't think we need to kind of like finish up with that. I think there's still in many schools where gender dynamics comes to play, where, uh, you know, girls might not feel that confident to raise their hand up and answer. You know, the way we are raised still, I think there is room for inspiring girls into being more confident and like, you know, they also this gap in role models. Girls and women don't have as many role models in science. So there is a need for such programs, but these programs are not going to remedy the gender gap. That's the point here. Yeah. For instance, let's take, uh, say, the government awards, right, which are considered highest level of recognition. One such, say, the Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Award, which was recently given. And in fact, only 19 women recipients have received since its inception in 1958. So a lot of people, when they see these awards and they see only male scientists winning it over and over again, they think, okay, women scientists are not up to the standards of excellence as expected. But that's not often the case, as your book points out. There is a lot of actually issues with the way the nominees itself, nominations are taken in. Could you just, you know, highlight that aspect? Because I found that very interesting. Sure. The Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Awards, I think they began to be given out in the 50s until very recently they were the highest possible honor that an Indian scientist could get from the government. And but quite early on, in fact, there was a woman scientist, I think it was Asima Chatterjee, who was the first woman to win the Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Awards in its, you know, very early, in its, within its first five years. Yeah, I think 1961 or something, yeah. Right. Quite early on in its run, we had a woman awardee, but then I think it was another... 14 years. Yeah, time before the next one and before the next chemistry prize that Asima got it for, it was another, I think, 50 or 60 years. So it's not like we were so far behind back then. Back then, it, we were having... It, it's just that the, the rate of women winning Chandi Suro Bhatnagar has barely increased over the decades. So which is really counterintuitive because the number of women getting into edu- being educated and getting into sciences has only been increasing. So obviously, when we see that still in the past two times of the Batagar Awards were given out out of 20 plus scientists, there was zero, a grand total of zero women who were given the award. So it's insulting because what else could it mean? except that women are not good enough. And and the highest officials, you know, including Shekhar Mande, who was the head of CSIR, which has been handing out these awards, and many, many other uh, scientific officers repeatedly insist that this is a completely meritorious project and, it's, you know, there is absolutely no uh, lobbying or nothing unethical that happens behind the stage. It's, it's highly professional. 
So at one, at one end, you're saying this and on the other end, you're saying no women awards. So what else could it mean except the fact that you're at some level, you're saying that women aren't good enough. But we heard from a lot of people within sciences, you know, within academia who are seeing up close this sort of race to win a Bhatnagar. It really is the b- first step towards any ambitious person in science, you know, anyone who has dreams of occupying positions of power, making change as a leader or director or a vice chancellor of institutes and universities. If you're in science, a Bhatnagar Prize is something that is just one of your first steps in the ladder. So what we hear from the inside is really there is a lot of these non, I mean, it's, it's clearly, it's definitely not only merit that is at play with respect to the Bhatnagar Awards and most likely even with respect to the other awards. And we, Ashima and I very recently wrote an editorial for the Indian Express also where we pointed out that because all, all awards have this problem, the Nobel Prizes are not at all an example to follow in terms of the number of women who have won. But even the Nobel, which, you know, everybody loves to bash and rightly so, even they have taken some steps or at least they have spoken out that they are cognizant of this giant gender gap among their laureates. And while they're against quotas, they claim that they're trying their best to correct this. With the Nobel Prizes, again, we know the procedure to some extent. And while there is a lot of transparency, at least after 50 years, all of the data becomes public. You get to know who nominated whom. Who won? So now if I look back, I can see how many times uh, Meghna Saha, for example, who has never won the Nobel, but he was uh, nominated multiple times. And I can even see who nominated him. And I can even, you know, notice and, you know, find it interesting that uh, C.V. Raman did not nominate him. Which is, so there's so many things that we can see and learn from and we get this data. Whereas the Bhatnagar has never revealed anything about its committees who are winning, who has been nominated, any statistics about nominations, all of that is hidden. But I do want to say that very recently, there was a huge revamp of this uh, science award system in India. And uh, it seems that they are planning to make, I mean, they have made the awards committee, for example, they know some of the members who they are. So Maybe it could lead to a bit more accountability, but really only fine can tell. And even in fact, uh, when you're lobbying for these awards or when you're being nominated, it requires a lot of social capital, uh, networking and uh, funding, which often gets delayed, especially with government grants, right? And a lot of devotion, which is quite, you know, easy to, to maybe expect it from a male scientist, but not so much from a women scientist because of the pressures of our society. When that much pressure on the nomination process and what you have to give it, you think that has to be eased up a little bit? Uh, I mean, I know it's a huge systemic change that is required. And with women leaders, with women scientists on top in these panels, are they a little wary about advocating for these kind of stringent uh, things that are very biased towards a male scientist? Are they afraid that it would come down to focusing on like maybe one, like how you had said, the old boys club would say, onto trivial issues? and not focusing on the quality of science or the quality of work that's presented? So I think firstly, you asked about like the nomination process. I think that is tedious and it could be simplified. I think that will help everybody. But I don't think like a lot of the women scientists who are coveting these awards are having a big issue with the process itself, but they do have a problem with the transparency of the process. It's completely opaque, uh, so no one can be held accountable. The main problem lies in who is getting selected in the end. I think all of these awards, Nobel Prize, SSB, you know, the new awards that we are yet to see, what happens with them in India, the Infosys Science Prize that we have. I think all of these need to realize that they are doing a lot more than just giving these awards out. You know, they are raising role models. They are kind of, in the previous question when you, uh, when Nanita answered, you also mentioned like, you know, people assume that there are no women scientists working when all the award winners are male. So there is some responsibility of these committees, of these awarding bodies that is being missed 
which is creating problems now they have a very easy cop out and say hey we are not here to do like social gender issues we are just looking at the best science but then again there are enough women scientists who go through this tedious process who have been applying who we have been talking to who have applied time and time again but have not won but everybody knows in this like secret whisper network that they deserve to win there's also the problem of ageism right that affects women a lot and i think it's time that we really say okay the nobel has been getting it very wrong and people have been pointing it out and at least like this new framework that we are adopting very soon in india should be more inclusive if you want to recognize just the science there are enough women i also want to add uh, something that like when i interviewed uh, some of the scientists about these things so when you're uh, talking about the awards you're already like now doing a filtering so we are no longer uh, necessarily talking to the university scientists the teacher scientists we're not necessarily talking to the phd postdocs we're talking at little bit experienced uh, scientists also not to experience because there's a age limit for the awards so these are already like recognized scientists in their field. and these women have been telling us that you know they have won awards outside the country they have been recognized outside of india but at home unfortunately they have not been recognized even though they have been applying time and time again there have also been like very condescending behavior where there have been calls to some of our sources where they've said madam we've shifted all the women scientists who applied for this award to the women scientist category yeah that's very patronizing yeah yeah and uh, you're right and i think firstly we just need like a inclusivity consciousness in these committees that's that's the important thing that's what i'm trying to say uh, and cuz they are doing a lot more than just recognizing science and even if you do that they've been doing it they've been missing out on a lot of great people true in fact talking about inclusion what was quite shocking is the top tier science institutes this not actually that inclusive gap is even wider and even now with the whole supernumerary seats that are now in iit which has uh, you know they don't like to call it reservation but still it's there for girls because of that there are now 20% of girls in iits but the responsibility of ensuring this gap is lesser not just for women but other marginalized genders and caste what does it take for these institutes to get a little more proactive on this i think what it should ideally take is just the realization that if they truly want to create a student body that is representative of the country that is doing useful things for the progress of the country then diversity is the only way to go but unfortunately i think a lot of institutes including the iits now i'm not fully convinced that they're not doing it just for the optics because suddenly it's not acceptable anymore it's even a lot of the university rankings around the world have a column saying that student gender ratio and the faculty gender ratio and and it's it's really stark that indian our top indian institutes are lagging behind when it comes when we're comparing it to the global universities around the country so it, it is uh, embarrassing for them and i think sometimes a lot of the initiatives that we see are to me it feels like more a reaction to this embarrassment you know we need to we need to save face so they end up being really shallow and they end up being more about how we look and how we say the right things rather than is it actually working or is it really benefiting all women or all people from different castes or various other marginalized groups in science so um the iits have done a good thing with this supernumerary scheme but it i think it ended in 2020 and they ended with 20% and their belief is that now that they've crossed 20% we will organically start increasing you know on our way to uh, 30 or 40 or whatever they aim for them and unless there are consistently studies and uh, number gathering and a lot of transparency with these numbers and tracking and finding out whether it's happening if it's not happening why isn't it happening what do we need to do then i think we'll just be now stuck in this next sort of stagnant 20% and then maybe 10 years later we realize that we introduce another scheme and 
it's it's a very unsustainable way to go unless there's also a parallelly the dialogue happening of why did we have to do this did we have to do this because we just gave up and our you know our girls are just not able to handle the je so we had to do this artificial push or have we ever i mean i'm waiting for the day that somebody from a je committee somebody from an iit says that the je is failing us there is something wrong with the je that it is not able to detect the merit among certain groups you know as amazing as the test is it is a flaw of the je and we are trying to address this or we are making moves to address this and until i, I hear that i'm not convinced yeah i just want to say i think there are people who are saying this but those voices are not that loud they we haven't reached critical mass there yet because of course there are problems with the je and with this you know the tutoring coaching thing that comes with it but didn't we hear this nandita that uh, the especially the iit those who have already passed out are very attached to the je because that's the there's a lot of like legacy issues because je has been found to be so good at finding the brightest minds and if you change the je it would mean that those have, who have passed out were not so great it's a thing these efforts are not to be taken so personally i guess this is about like going ahead and i just wanted to add to what nandita said is that diversity is great we need diversity diversity brings a lot of benefits especially in science where we need a diversity of ideas we need very less bias like uh, scientists always try to minimize bias as much as they can to find still workable meaningful result that's the premise of a scientific experiment that you minimize bias and if you want to do that you need diversity of ideas you need a diversity of voices and bodies and presence and perspectives and especially in a country like india which is so diverse which is so unequal we need to work on this on how our knowledge is produced and have a diversity component in it if we hope for our scientific and research efforts to translate to ground realities like it's essential uh, maybe this is why there is a theory that we've been you know thinking about a lot that maybe we are not so good in the ground realities because we are not so diverse with our knowledge, knowledge production and adding to that whole aspect of jee uh, exams and how there's in fact a statistic saying how women once they're into these uh, elite institutions they actually have a better average than boys so you know i wanted to add that point here yeah. but i also wanted to you know talk about your own experiences or both your experiences or what led to you know starting the life of science portal you were initially with a bangalore based uh, science magazine and you ca- saw the kind of tokenism and sexist uh, rendering of how you know science is and it was biased towards men what gave you that push once you know you said that publication closed shop and what actually gave you that impetus to say okay you know why don't we do this i think it was combination of these two things one was just this desire from two science communicators to find out what is the science being done in our you know backyards in the laboratories in our backyards the places that we don't usually hear from what are people doing there you know we have this image of test tubes and beakers but what is actually happening there what is the science that is being done there and and who are the people doing it so this was one aspect of what we wanted to do and the other one was this sort of bitter taste that we got of the gender gap in science while working for the magazine because the magazine catered to children uh, across the country and we became sort of hyper aware of the stories that we were telling knowing that these stories were going out to these young minds and we were used to interacting by email with you know some of our regular readers and there were boys and uh, girls and kids of all genders and it just really struck us what a disservice it was we were doing to them if we just repeatedly only spoke about scientists belonging to one gender mainly male scientists and very few indian scientists at all so so that as well as you know personal experiences that we've also spoken about in our book about working as women in a uh, professional spheres did sort of leave us with this reality check that things are not all 
well and all you know rosy in the country today with respect to science and with respect to women in the workspace so i think it was combination of these two sort of things that were bugging us that made us decide to start the life of science and if i actually may add uh, what ashima had said earlier on in our conversation about how we have the subconscious thinking about what science means as this lone warrior who comes across this eureka invention or discovery the idea that we need to dismantle that you know see that actually science whatever it gives us the results of it is actually a collective effort totally so many different warriors in the lab who combine together so i wanted to stress on that point I've also come across that both of you have given a lot of talks on this issue, but especially in, you know, when you go to institutes or like seminars or, you know, you have like an audience, when you start talking about these issues, do you get a lot of pushback? It has happened. I wouldn't say personally that I have, I got a lot of pushback, but it has happened. And I was many times quite uh, taken aback because I think early on it was more surprising because like Nandita said, we didn't have any fears that people will say, why only women? Because we were very clear that we are going only after interviewing women scientists. So between us, it made complete sense. When we created the portal, it was fine. But then when we started to do the talks and, you know, started to engage with the community, there were questions like, how long are you going to stick with women? Are you getting the right view? There were also some constructive things uh, where, uh, you know, scientists, uh, sociologists actually told us that you have to talk to the men. If you don't talk to the men, you don't know the rules. And this really blew my mind like, oh, okay, okay. So yeah it happens but not a lot especially in this time and age I think we are to be positive for a change I think things are on the mend and at least there there is a lot of work to be done but at least there is a consciousness the younger people assume that there is work to be done rightly they don't like just take it as it is but yeah of course there's pushback it also helped in our case that I think we said this in the book as well that when we give these talks we're generally speaking to an audience comprising the kind of people where we've heard these stories from so in a way we're relating back the stories what we've heard back to you know the same demographic so so you know i think a lot of times the people in the audience kind of saw the meaninglessness of pushing back because it's just what we heard right like you can't deny somebody's experiences so that's probably why we haven't received so much pushback as as if, if we were just you know sort of theorizing on this and speaking about our opinions and our viewpoints it was all so firmly based in what we heard from actual experiences of women in science and not not just like 10 or 20 but like 200 300 scientists that had been interviewed over this 6 7 years journey of the life of science so so really i mean i think uh, one pushback i remember is during one of our sessions was when one audience member spoke got up and said talked about the sexual harassment that she faced within campus there was a panel consisting of a lot of women scientists from that uh, institute and they immediately said uh, no ashley you're wrong because in our campus it's not like the outside there's no sexual harassment that happens and you know so that that and immediately there was a lot of counter pushback from the audience uh, with from other students and other people saying no we face this too we face this too so it became super fascinating and i i do think that the uh, the women on the panel also really sort of questioned their own perceptions and i think it did open their minds also about you know how one person's experience can be so vastly different from another true in fact that's another important topic that i want to talk about when we talk about women in workplace sadly the sexual harassment becomes part of the narrative obviously that's happening in academia as well especially since uh, say a phd student and a researcher who's called a principal investigator have like a very the student is completely relying on the pi for her or his growth and yeah your book mentions how there's such a hush hush culture because we hardly hear about such cases outside of academia circles i mean there are of course there are committees and everything but this hush culture uh, in the academia how can it be dismantled 
Yeah, also another very critical question. This is, like you said, a result of uh, this kind of dynamic between the PI and the student can, that can get really toxic very easily because of how it is arranged. And we've written about this in the sexual harassment chapter, which, by the way, was the hardest one chapter for us to work on. At least for me, it was this way because... It's a very sensitive topic and there is a big hush-hush culture around it. To get the information out on record as it is was really hard. How to get out of it? I think people need to be held accountable. And the committees, the ICC committees need to be more robust. Even the women scientists, I have to say, have to show solidarity with their women and their students and other uh, women scientists working in the institute, maybe the perpetrator or the accused is in their network, is, uh, you know, a friend or something. And I think we need to really, sometimes these things are, have been so hush-hushed, but so present in our country that we have found ways to kind of like block them out from our reality and just not accept it. I'm sure many can relate with that. And I think that needs to stop. I think uh, we need uh, solidarity between women. The law is there. I mean, of course, it needs uh, improvement, especially it needs inclusion of like trans realities, which it currently in its form doesn't allow because there is also uh, problems of sexual harassment there. And these committees need to be functional. And I think a big difference uh, from our experience of reporting this uh, and like interviewing people about the sensitive topic is who leads the institute, who is on these committee really, really matters, especially at the top. The ICC case is likely to go in the favor of the woman if there is a woman head of the institute. And we need student reps in the committees. We need diversity inside this committee. They exist, but they haven't been functioning so well. And especially with the way scientific research has be, is arranged, we need to pay more attention to it, especially because we haven't really even started to have a conversation about this because it's a lot more present than we dare to even think about. True. And talking about solidarity, like uh, women in, say, a slightly higher position, you know, say someone like Gagandeep Kang or uh, Rohini Godbole, who are you actually quite vocal and maybe, you know, can talk about these issues. But for many other women scientists, talking about anything political or sociopolitical issues can cause a lot of, uh, for their own, you know, career advancement, it can be a bit of a problem. Absolutely. I think uh, speaking about injustices is I think somebody we interviewed a, a male scientist actually that we interviewed who is quite vocal about about gender issues in science we asked him whether is it equally risky for you as a man is it a lot easier for you to be speaking out about these things and he said that he too has been discouraged by people because there's a lot of people who say why do you want to be seen as a spokesperson for this issue and you'd rather be known for your science but at the same time, he said that I can say a lot of things and get away with stuff that a woman can't. In fact, even if she is a senior person, and we've heard this from, you know, many of the names that you mentioned yourself, that if we say anything, they are, they considered whiners or, or even in the, in the best of cases, they suddenly become like this crusader for gender justice, uh, which completely erases their scientific identity. And this is something that a lot of these uh, women who, who are leading these movements within science have a problem with because they have given uh, decades of their lives to doing, you know, absolutely uh, remarkable and internationally renowned science. In the case of Rohini Godbole, we go, go into this in quite detail. And Rohini told us how it does irk her that, that despite, she wants to be known as a particle physicist, but a lot of the times she's invited to give talks about uh, women in science and a lot of other things that she is really passionate about, but she uh, obviously does not want that to take away from, from the other things that she's done. So I think that is a big reason why women are hesitant to take up a cause because it's already hard enough to uh, rise within the ranks once you uh, are seen as a troublemaker or somebody who wants to shake the boat too much, then your progress within academia becomes even tougher. Yeah, that sadly is the burden for women leaders in many fields uh, for them to carry. 
uh, when it comes to a upper caste woman versus upper caste men, there are like definitely some differences. But when it comes to upper caste women and those from marginalized genders or caste, the differences become even more stark. Have you questioned women scientists who are, you know, upper caste women scientists about uh, their support for those from these marginalized uh, gender or caste? How supportive have they been? Sadly, they haven't been that supportive in my immediate understanding. Uh, now that I think of it, I know that we try to understand this from the interviewees that we had already contacted midway through and we sent them a survey uh, talking about and asking about this, the reality of caste and even generally, like we sent out a, quite a few sub surveys to women scientists and sadly, this question wasn't met with a lot of nuance or a self-reflection. Uh, I think this is wider problem that us upper caste people, you know, keep on repeating that we are kind of unwilling or not really understanding this big reality of caste in India. Are kind of still afraid to uh, realize that we have had it uh, privileged historically in some way. So I, I don't think, I just when they uh, responded said, how does caste matter? Caste is not important, science is important. So even uh, this is the intersectionality that comes within the topic that we're discussing now, that just gender is not the marginalization. Even though a woman scientist from upper caste, if she hasn't gotten that award, doesn't mean like that experience gives her, you know, ability or the reflection to kind of talk about and extend her solidarities to people from lower caste in her surroundings, in her lab or in her institute. Uh, sadly, we haven't really seen that. Nandita, what do you think? Yeah, I think this is the reason a lot of people from marginalized caste really don't identify with the mainstream women in science movement in India because it it is largely the movement is sort of caste agnostic at best or would like to just pretend that this problem does not exist. And a lot of measures that are set to benefit women in science really do not benefit uh, a lot of women in science, a bulk of women in science because by numbers there are much, much fewer upper caste women in science but still they are the ones who do the best and they're the ones who represent the most uh, women in the community. There are a number of scientists who are extremely vocal about caste in science. These include uh, women from these castes themselves and also a lot of allies. Not, I wouldn't say a lot, but quite a few that we know and that we've also spoken about in the book for done research while we were writing the book. And I always find it interesting to see that uh, most of these women do not occupy mainstream scientific positions or, you know, they are also sidelined themselves. Of course, I can't say that they've been sidelined because of the kind of issues that they have taken up, but it, it does seem kind of impossible to for a person who's found great success and great recognition in science to also be a, a true ally in all these senses. It feels like there is a penalty. I mean, caste seems to be like such a, especially hush-hush topic, you know, much more than gender, that there seems to be some sort of a penalty you have to pay to uh, be too vocal about it. And and when, if you see that even upper caste scientists themselves are having to pay these penalties, then you can imagine how much this sets back the people from these communities themselves who want to speak about what they're going through. Yeah, it's quite sad. It's like upper caste women scientists have to be shaken up to be made aware of their privileges. The same thing that we are expecting of cis het men to be aware of their privileges and, you know, make little space for others. So, yeah, if only that realization dawns on everyone quicker. <laughs> you know, there have been efforts to document women in science and steps to take in it. That was done by the government and uh, other women scientists, which you have mentioned in your book as well. But uh, sadly, Beyond the initial response, you know, it didn't have much impact on how women need to be uh, incorporated into academia. Considering that your book is nuanced and well-researched, are you looking to, in a way, get it into the institutions or the upper echelons of you know, academia in the right hands to get people, at least one or two people, to start talking? And you know, How has the feedback been? 
I think, well, the feedback has been largely positive, but it's been kind of uh, unexpected and uh, I guess an encouraging sign to see that, for example, there have been uh, uh, quite a few of these scientific conferences, at least a couple of them, where they have ordered uh, you know, a bulk order of the book and given it away as souvenirs to the speakers who are often, you know, top people in science. And so I had this uh, recent interesting experience where where I was signing copies for, uh, you know, big officials of science in, in the country, some of whom who we have indirectly or directly critiqued in in, in the book. So I'm, I'm, I'm waiting to hear from, <laughs> waiting to hear if they actually read it and what they think about it. But at least one or two of them, you know, I think have been um, fairly receptive. Uh, for example, the former principal scientific advisor of the country, Dr. Vijay Raghavan, who has been, uh, you know, quite encouraging of our work in the past. And, and we've had, I think, a few disagreements backstage about you know the way many things go but but just to see you know people like him and of course some others also being receptive to the book and and to see a lot of interest within institutes it makes us realize that that the individuals within science often do have a uh, higher as- aspiration have do hope for better science and Somehow, I think when it comes to the institute level or the systemic level, this gets lost. But just to see this uh, book being seeping into the places that need it the most make me feel like maybe uh, someone's listening and maybe some change is possible. Yeah, I think that's uh, at least some amount of positive note to to you know focus on. There was a good positive note, so I'll just extend it. That I think so. This was a this is a very critical book. It is also a very adversarial book. Like you know, we are actually envisioning something which is very positive, and we are standing on a lot of feminists in science who are also already before us have envisioned a more inclusive culture of Indian science. And I think it can be a strength and it's going to be a lot more fun uh, to do science in an open culture that we are imagining, a more inclusive culture. It's possible and it's coming, but there are we have to pay attention to the mistakes that we are making and not reinforce the stereotypes and not repeat the biases, you know, reduce the policing and kind of understand that this natural idea that science and femininity or uh, masculinity and science this it really doesn't really make sense it's an old idea and what we really want is the true values of science which is openness and diversity in fact and progress and we'll definitely get there yeah (laughs) on that note Thank you so much, Nandita and Ashima, for joining. And uh, it was wonderful talking to you both. And I really hope your book, Lab Hopping, goes to the right people and makes the right impact. So all the best for that. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Mati. Thank you so much, Ma. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. If you have any queries or feedback, you can reach me at maharanitalks at gmail.com or at maharanitalks on Instagram. Take care.